Betting Franchise Secrets, Eric Von Horn. If you're not a part of the Franchise Secrets Facebook group, what are you waiting for? It's FranchiseSecrets.com slash Facebook. I cannot believe how valuable this group turned out to be. When someone asks a question, the feedback is honest, authentic, very helpful, and it's from multiple perspectives. If you're not sure that you're getting the most accurate information about franchising, then check out the largest, most helpful Facebook group in all of franchising. Whether you're a Z, a Zor, a buyer, or investor, join our free Facebook group at FranchiseSecrets.com slash Facebook. Hey, Franchise Secrets. In this episode, I had David on, and we uh, talked about recruiting, executive recruiting. Like, who should you recruit? Why should you recruit them? And he's like, he's amazing at this stuff. People pay him a lot of money for this. Um, and franchisees, franchisors can all, underst- I can all learn from this. Uh, we also got into some cool technology, um, technology that's useful and helpful, things that he's doing, things that he's working on. We got into lead generation for franchisees and franchisors. Um, so hopefully that will be helpful to a lot of you out there. Enjoy this episode with David. All right, man, you and I uh, are using a new platform for the podcast called Riverside, and we're both testing it out on both of our podcasts. So if this podcast sucks it's because um of riverside not because of us right (laughs) that's right let's be very clear about that yeah so we've done we had you into the into the mastermind to talk about uh like recruiting and you did a great session i got great feedback in that mastermind and uh so i thought let's do a podcast on it to give the listeners a a little bit of what we talked about inside that mastermind um, and where I want to start is I remember being a part of a franchise organization where the franchise or had a corporate location and they crushed it. That corporate location did so well. And uh, that was like how they sold so many franchises as well. Well, come to find out after nothing was done wrong, but what I found out later after being in the system for a while, what they did is they recruited a key person from a competitor And that person had all the relationships that they needed to have that business excel. And that's exactly what happened. So other franchisees coming in, they didn't know that was the key to to success. But I heard that. I'm like, wow, I don't want to, I need to find out why some of these franchisees are successful. And as I've looked at it over uh, different timeframes, David, I've seen people recruit a talent away and that's a large part of their success. And I'm guessing you've seen the same. I have, um, you know, I've been in the industry for so long since I was 25 and I'm 50 now. I know it doesn't seem that way, but you look, you look like all, it's all, I think it's, I'm 47. It's all yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's an interesting thing about, about human capital. I call it human capital because it's really, that's really what it is. And being in private equity, venture capital, I've started franchise systems and, um, also, um, acquired and sold franchise systems, but I've owning a recruiting firm, an executive search firm. I got my start recruiting for executives and franchising. So that's how you and I got to know each other over the years, right? That's right. So, um, but what we did is interesting. The recruit, our recruiting firm, we became the fifth largest firm in Utah in only 18 months. And how we did that is kind of what we're going to talk a little bit about how we did that. Cause I want this to go along with what you're talking about with franchising because that, that, that company, they did it right. It's very simple. Isn't it simple? Just go to the competitor, right? So, and I I talked about this on the last episode. It's you either have two choices in, in recruiting. You can either shotgun approach and just blast out, you know, go on LinkedIn and post jobs on Indeed and stuff like that, which is fine, but it's not really going to get the best people. So if you were to say, okay, over the last 25 years that you've been doing the recruiting, Um, how many of those were placed by an ad, right? That's a good question to ask. 
Thanks, Eric. I should have asked that question. question. If I was question, good, I would ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> that the number is one percent. Wow. So one out of a hundred, um, and these are executive director, anything from board members and CEOs all the way down to like regional managers. But most of our stuff was for the franchise or we didn't really have a lot of success on the franchisee side, but the franchisee side's actually, um, going more in that direction. Now, um, my ex owns, um, uh, Zen recruiter, it's called Zen recruiter. And, Zen Recruiter does basically they they recruit for franchisors and the franchisees and they do a they do a, an agreement with the franchisor to help them. It's a brilliant model, and they're doing very well. And I'm happy for her and for her company. It's awesome to see the success. We focused on solely the executives uh, level and high high level directors and managers, um, and that's where we found the success. But going directly to the source is is it the first question I asked the CEO is, who do you want? It's like, oh, I want a VP of marketing. Okay. Who do you want? Well, I, I need a VP of marketing as his background. I'm like, no, who do you want? Mm -hmm. Oh, I want Eric. Okay. Eric mm -hmm. comes back with this, with this experience and that's who, and then I go and call Eric and I get the placement and make $50,000. It's how ridiculous it is. Right. And I tell him, go do it yourself. Oh, I don't want to. I mean, I'm telling you, this is, it's crazy that people are afraid to go to the comp competition. And why are they afraid? Why are they afraid to go to the competition to get the best person? Um, I think a lot of times it's actually pride. Um, they're afraid of their pride having to go do something that's uncomfortable for them. You know, mm -hmm. it could be fear. Uh, the other thing is, is that um, it's not so much, I don't know if it's laziness or um, they're also kind of like a lot of, a lot of CEOs, uh, they're always telling me the same thing. They're like, well, I don't want them. I don't want the company knowing that I recruited them out. It's like, it's, it's a, it's like a hit to their, their ego a little bit and to their reputation. So it'd be, they feel more comfortable. Um, I'm not going to say who it is, but a very large multi-brand investment firm in franchising they used to f threaten to sue us because we would recruit their people, but they used recruiters to get their people. <laughs> Here's I'm the not thing, kidding so, you. <laughs> it's so, like, like people want opportunity and they're not going to, they won't leave if they're happy where they are and they have room to grow where they are. And like, they don't have to leave. They're leaving for a reason. I put a post out and I have a, a pretty substantial database now of um, franchise development people, CEOs, CMOs, all C-level executives and some like district operational people all in franchising because uh, my portfolio brands, uh, brands that I have equity in or uh, phantom stock or advisory shares, like if they're looking for somebody, I, I want to be able to send a, an email out to this list to see if anybody wants to raise their hand. So I'm kind of doing executive recruiting for the people that are in my in my world. Um, but then I put out there on social, hey, if you are thinking about, you know, seeing what's out there in the job market or you want to, you know, explore different opportunities at different times, fill this information out. And man, I can't tell you the amount of like great people that I know who they are. I know how amazing they are. Their names are on there. And nobody else knows like who they who they are and how how great they are and they're actually looking. I'm like, if people actually knew some of these people that were open to other opportunities, yeah. like yeah. they they would be getting hounded. And then when you start talking to some of these people, we're not the only ones recruiting. They're getting recruited by competitors as well. So yeah. like that's the game out there. Either you play it or you're not going to get the best people. Good, great points. Um you know, Eric, what's really interesting, do you know that nine out of 10 executives that I've talked to in 25 years are deathly afraid to talk to their bosses? What about do you mean? How they, about how they feel. When we recruit them, I, we always would tell them, like, you guys, listen, I'd be scripting with you, Eric, as the candidate, right? Well, Eric, we have this VP of 
development position. It's a perfect fit for you. You like them. You, they like you, obviously you're probably going to get an offer, but Eric, just to make sure, are you sure you want to do this? Because when you leave, you're most likely going to get a counter. And if you get a counter, how, how are you going to feel about that? And so I have literally personally helped thousands of executives get raises and all <laughs> I'll tell you that it's literally a quick secret. It's all it is. Um, Eric, Eric, you're, you're going to your boss. You say, Hey, Bob, listen, I, I love working here. I really like it here. And I've worked my butt off and I, I gotta be honest with you. I'm getting recruited. I've got executive recruiters coming after me right now and other companies if they are. And I would like to stay here, but my offers are coming in pretty substantial. So what can we do to make this work? I just don't want to do it and then have you come back to me because I don't want to leave because of, of a dumb reason like money. And it's usually money. And then the other thing is maybe some appreciation here and there, which is, I think, a big factor. But I have helped so many people get raises. And, you know, most recruiters are like, why would you do that? Like, because they're going to they're going to take the counter. And here's the problem. Uh, there was a study done by, I believe it was Harvard. It's awful, Eric. Um, if you take a counter, you'll be gone within 18 months. So if you take the counter from the company, it'll be so, and what ends up happening is it's the psychological, like the company's upset because you were going to leave. And so they had to counter you to come back. Or you're just not happy being there. So you end up leaving in 18 months. It's like 77% or something like that. So it's, it's, it's very difficult to make it work. So you have to make sure that, that you, the person understands how important that is that, you know, they either stay or they go, but franchising is very open, Eric. Everyone's really open to listening. It's unbelievable. It's probably one of the, the strangest industries because most people are just open. And when they say they're not, I always tell them, well, I'm sorry about that. Cause I had a million dollar offer for you. So I'll talk to you later. And then they would come back. <laughs> I'm like, I tell him the story. I'm like, well, somebody did that to me. And I said, he wouldn't talk to me. And he was a perfect fit. They had to speak, listen to this. They had to speak Japanese, Spanish, and English. <laughs> I found somebody like when I was 28 no years way. old. And I, I'm literally, I'm, I, I tell this as a joke, but it's true. He wouldn't contact me. wouldn't call me back. Kept saying no. And then finally I just told him, I'm like, you know, it's probably going to be, it's going to be a huge offer. And there's a lot of, he was like, it's not about the money, blah, blah. I'm like, well, bull crap. <laughs> and then, and then he goes in and talks to him. Guess what? He made $3 million off the, off the acquisition two years later. Wow. So he went from making like 200 a year and then he got 250, 275 plus he made 3 million on the, and plus bonuses. I mean, the guy made a ton of money and he was like, I, you know, I was, I can't believe <laughs> I almost didn't talk to you. So a lot of times, if you just talk to people, it's just a numbers game, Eric, like anything, franchise development, it's just a numbers game. You've got to talk to a lot of people, kiss a lot of frogs. And the thing is, though, is uh, a big lesson for us has been over the years, with, especially with my private equity firm, too, is that um, you got to make sure you understand their track record and you got to check and make sure they've done it because you and I both know in franchise sales. There's so many bullshitters out there. It's like, it's insanity, right? Yep. Everyone's lying. 90% of people lie on their resumes, according to Harvard uh, Business Review. I think it's true, a though. great point. I don't think um, whenever we're recruiting, um, we're always thinking we're going to offer them something. And it has to be so compelling so when they do go and have that conversation with their current employer, their counter is not going to, is not going to be, you know, compelling enough for them to stay. Right. What, what advice would you have for the brand that's wanting to pull a top talent from another brand away and wanting to, and knowing they're going to get a counter? Great question. Um, I think there's a few things. Um, we do not take care of candidates in franchising at all. Like it's really bad. I was talking to a VP of HR of a multi-billion dollar company. She's one of the very few um, HR VPs that I have a tremendous amount of respect for because I find that a lot of HR 
it's kind of like most, like a, like for CFOs, CFOs are hardly ever CFOs. They're never strategic. They're always controllers, right? That's the, that's the majority of the time. So don't say you're a CFO because you're not a CFO. You're actually a controller. Same thing goes for HR. It's like they, for me, they have a big, big job to do is to fill those roles is to have a great, um, uh, what does Gary V always say? The culture has got to be a certain way. He's the chief people officer of his own company. That's what he says is the most important job. So that's the first thing is they don't know how to take care of them. I, I'm telling you just something as simple as um, picking them, having them picked up uh, from an Uber. You could do it. your, you know, like you can do it on your, on your phone and just pay for the person and have it set up for them. You don't have to do all this. You know, I have can't even tell you how many chief development officers, CEOs that have waited two, three months to get their money back from the trip. <laughs> I mean, it's insanity. You would, and you would be surprised the brands. I'm not going to name them, of course, but it's it's pretty sad. Um, also, um, you need to have something that allows them to feel like they have a future. And most there's like most jo most job uh, orders in the business are. There's not a job description or it's like a ridiculously generic one. Um, they don't have uh, like a, they're not selling their company. They're just offering like, here's a job. It, that's literally what it is. Or they go overboard in the CEOs or the, or the leaders will say some off just crazy lunatic. We're going to have a thousand locations in two years kind of thing. And they have one. So, so, I mean, it's more about, it's more about just treating them really well. And I actually shared this with you last time, that VP of HR that I love, she, um, she, so like, let's say she has five candidates going through the process at the end, right? All five cup, they, they all have, most of them have spouses and they, and then only one gets the job. So what she does is she pays for all of the candidates that lose the job. And who gets the job? She buys them a night on the town to go to the movies and a dinner for two on the company. And this is an interesting thing because she told me they had two salt. They always have like two solid candidates and they all have to pick one. And she said that that one candidate didn't work out. And the second candidate's wife said, you better take that job because they took care of us. See what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. the, the spouse was like, I love that company. I want you to go work for them. And, and she said, because of doing that over the years, when she would go back to those other candidates, they were like, yeah, I'm in like all of them. She said, so just something as simple and stupid as that can really make a difference. Um, it's taking care of people. I, met, I don't know what book it was. Um, it's not, I don't think it was purple cow. It's one of these books that they um, maybe it was raving fans, but an NFL team, had a locker room that was amazing. And they took such good care of the opposing team. And so the opposing team would come in and have this amazing experience. And they're like, man, if this is how, if this is how they treat the opposing team, how well do they treat their, their real team? And so, you know, it was just an opportunity to recruit and, and make themselves stand out in a crowd of, mediocre locker rooms. Of, uh, I, I love that, Eric. I absolutely love that because, you know, did you know that um, about 15 years ago, I read an article about Toyota. They were talking about vendors not getting paid in like Forbes or fortune or something. And, um, yeah, and uh, Toyota was ranked number one for working with vendors. They paid the vendors as soon as they got the bill. Can you imagine if you treated your vendors that way? So what ends up, what ends up happening when, as we've both been executives in companies before, what happens when our company's not paying people on time and they're contacting us? And it's like, that's the last thing I need to worry about is a bill getting paid. Well, sorry, David, we are 60 days. I'm like, no, we're not just pay them. Like <laughs> it's very, very difficult. And I know that we've, you know, we've all struggled. I had my private equity firm during the recession. So I, I, we were getting killed, but we are, but you have to be communicative with them and let them know, here's where we stand. Here's where we're at. But, but take care of those people too. Um, when, when most people don't want to talk to the companies, Eric, you know, most of the time it's because of stupid stuff like this. Like it's because they heard from other people. Our industry is small. What do we have? Like 3,900 mm -hmm. franchisors or something. It's a small industry. You can't okay. treat people bad and then, you know, and then go out. 
Another thing on the other side that I blame the uh, candidates for is that there's a lot of professional candidates out there. Oh, and mm. they're good, Eric. They are good at. I don't know the interviews. Teach me. Oh, the interview. They're they're so good at interviewing, but they're horrible. I had a president. He's one of the most popular figureheads in franchising today, and he is the worst president I've ever worked with. I had I had nine presidents when I had private my private equity firm that reported to me, and he was a thirty five year veteran, and he was horrible. He was awful. The VPs hated him. I, I couldn't believe that he was in that position. So, um, but those things happen sometimes because they're so good at interviewing. They're just brilliant at it. So if they, if he suckered me and I have all this experience with it, I knew him for 15 years. He was actually a friend and I had to fire him one day because he did some stupid lying stuff and my partner was upset with him and I had to just fire him and he was a friend and he, everyone was crying in the room. It was horrible, but he's, he's doing really well now because he's doing what he's, he's doing the right thing in his category of what he was good at. And see, that's a lot of, that's another thing too, is sometimes, um, where, uh, one of the subjects I think we should talk about is, is, is putting too much on the, the candidate. So meaning like, oh, you know, Eric, you would be perfect. Can you be my CDO and my COO? I want you operations and development. And this happens all the time with like really? newer companies. Oh yeah. It's re it's insane. And I'm like, okay, right, slow down for a second, sir. <laughs> let me, let me get, let me be very clear with you. That is wrong because people are either operations or they're more on the marketing and sales side in franchising, right? You're, you're the, those are the two main departments in franchising that are the most common for recruiting. 65% of our placements were development because people wanted to grow really? the rest. Most of them were operations and about 10% were marketing. I, I think we placed like two or 3% in finance and other positions, but everybody just wanted development. They just wanted to grow, 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 grow. So there's two options out there. Really? <clears throat> there's the option of hiring, uh, hiring a company to do it. Give us a sense of, of the cost of hiring a company to do this. And then let's talk about some, give some takeaways on how to go recruit yourself if you want okay. to do that yourself. Okay. So, um, I think recruiting is, uh, incredibly, uh, difficult. I made it sound simple and stupid at the beginning, but it actually is very difficult. Um, in most HR departments, they don't really have quality recruiters in there. So they're, so, and what I mean by that is they're getting, you're getting a bunch of fives and fours, Instead of getting seven, eights, and nines, very rarely do you get a ten. Why? Quality. Why are they getting fives and fours? And because not they're just nine they're nines? they're they're going through a process of lead generation, and it's like these are the best I can get, and they're because it's here. what they're doing. It's not because it's just they're doing it wrong. Right. Yeah. Got it. Now some some departments will go to competitors, but it's it's super rare. It, even after all this time, I find it really amusing that I'm even having this conversation. Eric, I had the same conversation when I was 25 years old in the industry. It's the same conversation. People are not going to the competitors. So you can do, uh, it depends on the position. So if you're tar starting at franchise or level, executive level, I would, re you know, I would recommend using an executive search firm. Um, they will charge, I've seen people as low as 15% with annual uh, salary, uh, annual salary. And, but mostly it's around 25%. Um, I've always been 25 to 30%. And, and you pay up front? You pay at the time of placement? Uh, you pay a retainer up front um, of, a, of a proportion of it, depending on who the company is. But usually, like the big names like Corn Ferry and all that kind of stuff, those guys are insane. They charge um, uh, they charge a third, a third, and a third. So a third now, a third when, it, when you get the interviews, and then a third at the end. Um, I've done that as well. But usually, I just take a portion up front, like, I don't know, 25, 35% up front. And then the rest of it we get as, as it goes. Um, if they retain the searches, it's a lot more uh, successful, to be honest with you. Um, what do you mean? What do you mean by that? Uh, if they don't retain the search, um, our, our numbers are horrible. Like it's like when they, when they just gave us the job and said, please help us find this person. And they, they were communicative and everything. Um, the placement, 
the quality of the process was horrible. The placement was horrible. It's like, if you don't put skin in the game and buy a franchise, you're not going to do as well as if, if you just start your own company. The, the numbers are insane, right? 15% compared to 85% or whatever success rate. So it's the same thing when you don't retain. It's, it's, not, it's not me saying this because I've owned recruiting firms for 25 years. It's because it just, it's just the number. It just doesn't work. So we, we don't do anything unless it's retained. Um, and then the, uh, <clears throat> so we got that out. And then if they, if they're, if they're going to do it themselves, I actually think it's pretty simple, Eric. I think they just need to come up with a list of what they want. And, you know, sometimes they get so weird and strict about their industry. And you know what I'm talking about, right? If you're going to go to franchise development, it's not, I mean, it's really not that different. Um, I know restaurants are probably different hotels, but for the more majority of the time, franchise sales is franchise sales, you know? And I really think that if they, um, if they just go after like in that position, they just go after the best of the best who have done it. And I always recommend they go with smaller company people. So like someone from a smaller company or a mid-sized company. And the biggest reason why is because the big companies, they have so many people underneath them. Mm. Do you see what I'm saying? Like I, I had a VP, I had a chief development officer. I placed him at a big investment firm um, years ago, and uh, he had 25 people working for him in franchise sales. So when he went to the small company with two or three salespeople, he didn't do nearly as well. He just yeah. couldn't do it because he didn't have the resources and stuff. And so they were disappointed. And I said, "Well, I told you, go after the smaller. If you go after the smaller guys, then you're going to get a VP who's actually selling, who's actually closing." who's engaged and involved. Um, so sometimes it's not, it's not always the best thing to go after those people. The other thing, Eric is like, you know how these brands, like some of these brands are going crazy, like uh, uh, dirty dough, dirty dough is going nuts. Then it's doing amazing things, right? Yes. I do not, I don't put hardly any value on a franchise development person in that field, in that company. <laughs> Right. I mean, I'm just being, I'm being fair. Well, They're a great is, company. This is a, this is, a, this is very true. It's very, very, very true. So here's the deal with the Franchise Tribe Mastermind. It's full of a bunch of successful franchisees across many different industries, many different brands, and you get to be a part of that. Now, if you've had any level of success in franchising, you've probably been around top performing Z's in your current brand. So think about that. And if you could do that with 40 plus different brands, industries, franchisees, that's the value in the mastermind. I bring in some of the best speakers in the world. We talk about some topics that will never be talked about anywhere else. So if you're interested in being a part of a group like that, check out franchisetribe.com. Yeah. So um, on the, on the franchisee level, they, they just need to go talk to the people. Like we would, we would have um, conversations with franchisees and just, just the same with crumble. Like you, you like crumble yeah. crushed it. I know. And like, you're just shooting fish in a barrel. Okay. What if someone is, this is going to development too, cause this is all franchise conversation, but uh. okay. So you got, you got a company with unit economics making $45,000 in profit, right? And, the, and that guy or gal is selling 35 locations a year by themselves. I go with them. They, yep. they got a yeah. shitty brand. They don't, it's not popular. That's one of the reasons why Neighborly's done so well is because Neighborly, Neighborly got it to a system, right? They don't have the sexiest brands. You know, I've, I've, I've known Dina for a long time and the whole, the whole system that they set up was, was, was a, a system of telemarketing call center. They were going after the leads themselves, trying to get that stuff going, but they actually worked for, you know, they killed what they ate. <laughs> right. So anyways, that's, that's something I would be careful of is, is that's um, a great point though. And I mean, here's the other thing too. Um, as franchisees, if you're part of a brand that is crushing it, like crumble orange theory used to, they still do well, but they're sold out. They, they crushed it. Yeah. Yeah. If you're crushing it as a franchisee with one of those brands, don't fool yourself into thinking it's you. Like you, if you go into a other brand that is not nearly as strong, it's hard. You might have big struggles because the brand can make the franchisee, not 
not very often. Most times it's the franchisee that is the is the is the is the crux of that. But I've seen some of these brands where they're just such they're so great and their franchisees struggle in other brands. And then I've seen other brands where franchisees were doing okay, but they were grinders and they had to figure things out and they go into an, an easier brand, a probably more proven brand, a brand with higher profit margins and easier labor and, and less moving parts and they crush it in those brands. So like it, it, it goes from development to being a franchisee, but that's a true statement. People don't talk about that kind of stuff very often, but I feel well, that to be true. The devil's in the details. So let me, so let me give the people in, that are listening so a little piece of advice here. I mean, if you're going to have a, let's say a franchise salesperson staying on that subject. Okay. You sold 25 locations last year. Fantastic. Okay. How many franchise salespeople were there? Uh, well, there was three. Okay. So you sold. how many did you sell all year? I always ask how many has the company sold total? And then how many have you sold? Because if you go the other way, a lot of times they'll lie to you. And I said, so how many did the other, so you sold the most. And then what did the other two sell? Well, they sold about 10 or 15 a piece. So, and I'm like, the numbers are all garbled up now. You, you have to find out where there's a lie. The other thing on the details is, okay, so let's say someone did sell 25 locations and they did it by themselves and they ran pretty much the department, but they're really a franchise salesperson. So they're a great fit for your, for your business to come in. How did you get those 25 sales? How many of those were broker leads, consultant leads? How many of those were lead generation from companies? How many were those directly into the company? How many, how many, how many? You got to break it down and find out because if you don't do that, then all of a sudden you're like, okay, so brokers did 80% of your deals. Is that because of your relationship with the brokers? I mean, you know, you, w there's so many ways you got to peel the onion on every level. Because you know. sometimes as a brand, if you're going into the broker networks, you want a, you want a franchise development person that has those relationships. Yes. And, and, and yep. especially in specific networks, that that's the key. If you want, if you're a brand, you want to go crush it in the broker networks, you need a, multiple things to, to, to be in your favor. But one of those things is you need a franchise development person that has relationship with the great brokers out there, multiple networks. If you don't have that, it doesn't matter. They're great at organics, like an organic lead, website lead, paid leads, whatever. And they go into the broker world, even though they might, closing a sale from a, an organic is a lot harder than a broker. Uh, if they're better at that and they go into the broker world, relationships trump skill and, and, yep. and closing organics. Yeah, so there's a balance there, right? A lot of franchise systems, what they'll do is they'll have a relationship franchise development person and they'll have a franchise salesperson. So yep. they're like, they're two different people sometimes, right? Because they are so relationship driven and, and that's fine too. Um, personally, I think that uh, they need to focus more on the lead gen on that level, but that's a whole nother conversation. I think they need, I, I think that brokers should be a big part of it, but I don't think they have to be all of it. A lot of companies are so focused on brokers because it's uh, coming to them and they have yep. good relationships, good numbers. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying, you know, what happens if, you know, you gotta, you gotta be careful too. So, Hey, what about lead gen? Do you know much about lead gen? You, on the can front. you recruit for lead gen? Like what lead gen's tough. We just, one of my portfolio brands just had a discovery day and we were talking about it and they're great at organic, but it's a brand that screams organic and they get organic lead gen. They've got franchisees of other great brands. Mm -hmm. And it's just a, you know, it's just one of these where people go in and they're like, I, I love this concept. I love the store. I love this location. So it's easy to create organic. They're very Instagrammable. The founder is very, you know, bubbly and, and charismatic. And so it's easy for that brand to go to get organics. But from a, a lot of these brands out there, they think they have this great product they have this great system and processes, and yet they start to sell, David, and it's like, they're like, this was harder than I thought. It's Even so hard. Even them, it's going to be harder yeah. than you think. Mm -hmm. They're like, this is way harder than I thought. So like, for, let's talk about lead gen for a little bit. Well, that's a, that's a good point. Um, you know, lead gen's like anything. Like my, I own, uh, I own a couple businesses right now in franchising, and one of them is, is Long Yards Storage. Um, it has... Um, uh, it's a great concept. It's very successful from the locations that we just, uh, built and it's very lucrative, but it's a, it's a higher end model. So it's a bigger yep. investor, right? 
So going after those people, it's, new, it's a newer model. I talked to the model. founder a while ago. Yeah, Chris is newer he's model. Wonderful, really guy. cool. It's a great concept, but it is newer. So, but Legion is all about numbers. It's like you gotta you gotta get you gotta get to the right people, and you gotta go through the numbers. So one of the things that we're we're doing now is we just we're setting it up actually as we speak. We're using a, a CRM program, and we're using a dialer system like uh, Kixi or Just Call, something like that. Like a dialer. We're using system. Go High Level. Yeah, we're using Go High Level, and we we're using Go High Level because it's a great opportunity for franchisors to have an inexpensive model for the franchisees. So instead of the franchisees paying an arm and a leg for HubSpot, yeah, hundreds of dollars a month, you can do something much less expensive, and you can and you can run it yourself and have your own person. So like instead of paying them, you're paying the franchisor for the service, and then you have a, like a full time person doing it. Yep. Again, that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> we talked about that on the mastermind, and I actually got uh, the guy that built out one of the one of the big guys built built out their whole go li go high level system. So if you ever need another referral on building out amazing go high level stuff, let me know. I would, yeah, I'd, I'd love to talk to anyone on that stuff because you know it's all. Of, listen, I I told Chris, uh, I said, you know, th he who holds the lead holds all the power, and. It's like that in every business, right? So going and finding investors, going and finding landowners, going and finding, we're not going through real estate agents. We're doing everything ourselves from the scratch. We're going directly. So the same thing with franchising, go directly to the source, you know, in, in 2008, my ex-wife and I, Laurie, we started uh, queen of leads and queen of leads was we, all we did was called up whoever the franchisor wanted us to call. Who do you want as a fran have franchisee? Uh, we want real estate agents. Great. We went to a real estate agent list. We called it. And then we had five ladies calling up all day, every day. And they were like $200 leads, right? Because they were qualified. They were interested. Uh, this was for Housemaster. It was Housemaster was the first franchisor I ever bought. And uh, they had like almost 400 locations. And they wanted to grow. And so we were bringing all these, uh, these, these candidates to the table from the franchising or from the real estate world, but we went directly to them. So they had never even thought about franchising. They were like, I, you know, they owned a, a, a firm and they, they were owners, but they had never thought about franchising, most of them. So we went directly to the source of what was the best fit. And guess what? Those people were awesome franchisees because they were the ones with the relationships with the other real estate agents that caused more business for home service, the home service business, all right, for home um, inspections. So uh, I think the lead generation needs to be very laser focused on who your demographic is of who you're going for and just go after them. And you know what, Eric, people, if you listen to a podcast now in all industries, you know what lead generation they're saying now, you've got to get on the phone and call them. So using a dialer like Kixi, like Just Call, some of these other guys. When you use when you use uh, uh, HubSpot or if you use Go High Level or whatever, you you hook it up to that and you just start calling those people up. And what's cool thing about it is, did you know when you make calls and you have a hundred phone calls in a day, that if you leave voicemails on those, think about it. Most voicemails take a minute, two minute, three minutes to leave voicemails. You're you're talking about an hour and a half a day that's gone. That program, when you're when you're leaving, when you're calling them, and the voicemail pops on, you just press leave voicemail, number one, and it's like, hi, this is Eric from such and such. You know, give me a call when you get a chance. I just sent you a text you message. Voicemail too. Yeah. You're high energy. Yep. Yep. And and so so on our dialer, Chris, Chris, we're leaving Chris's voicemail, who's a super cool guy, as you know, super energetic. And Chris, like, hey, listen, I really want to purchase your location and blah blah blah. You know, I'm looking to. You know, let's do this, this, and that. I just sent you a text message, and they're like, "Oh, cool!" And then they call us back. Well, in one day with the dialer, we can leave like two, two hundred and fifty voicemails a day. Plus, we're emailing. Plus, we're texting. See, that's the whole thing about it's just a numbers game. Everybody's like, "What's the secret?" Uh, use the numbers to your advantage. Recruiting was a hundred companies, one client that closed, and those clients were closing at thirty-five thousand dollars in commission. So, those are that's a lot of money. See what I'm saying? So it's like, it's just a numbers game. It's just, you got to play the numbers. So if any salesperson ever complains or recruiter or, or in, in whoever I've had in my companies and they're in sales, I always say, well, d what are the numbers? Show me the numbers. Did you make a hundred phone calls today? No, I made 15. Okay. Well, <laughs> good luck with that.
you know? So it's very simple. I think. Have you done ringless voicemails with that? Yes, but 65% of the time it works. So I don't like that because you know, Eric, when you get that message and it's like, and we can't wait to talk to you about your mortgage, yeah. you know, it's okay. like halfway through. That's the problem is okay. that the AT&T Verizon, uh, all those guys have different algorithms. And so it only works 67% of the time. That's the number that I'm getting now. But if you use the dialer and you're dialing, it's, it's dialing them directly and then leaving the voicemail. It, it works like 99% of the time. Are you using a uh, virtual assistance to dial out or are you yes. doing that? Yeah. Yes. I'm what, using what VAs, can... uh, from, from, um, my wife's home country of the Philippines. Yeah. So it's, it's great. great. It's awesome. And they're, they're, they're very nice people and stuff, but you, I only use them for very simple scripting, but most of the calls don't pick up. Yeah. They're so going straight to voicemail. It, and that's what you But it's Chris and I's number. It's like, <laughs> it's like they're contacting Chris, they think, or yep. Chris is calling them, they think, but actually it's a, and if they do pick up, then the person says, Hey, listen, I'm calling you because my CEO is interested in acquiring this or talking to you about this. Do you have some time tomorrow, the next day to talk? It's just an appointment setting. It's real simple. Attention franchisors, if you are not bringing in many of the right franchisees, sales are slow. It's stealing too much of your time as a founder trying to award franchises to the right franchisee. There's a better way to do it. That's why I started the Franchise Sales Mentor. If you want to have access to the information, the techniques, the ways that the best franchise sales organizations are awarding franchisees, then you might want to check out the Franchise Sales Mentor. The reasons that franchisors join is because they want access. They want access to my Rolodex. They want access to my connections. They want access to shortcut both short-term and long-term success to increase enterprise value to their brand. Yep. Cheap I love that hell too. I love $4, $5. What do you an pay? I just had a podcast with a, with a guy named Cossum. He's amazing at all of this stuff. Um, and we talked about hiring overseas and we, we went into some amazing detail with it. Um, but what do you pay a di a, a phone setter um, in the Philippines for something like that? The the company that we're using, our guy got them for four dollars an hour. I mm -hmm. think she's I think she's four or five dollars an hour. Um, there's other companies. The the companies when you or when you get it from like an American company and then they do it, you're gonna get not as good of a deal. But if you go to Upwork, yeah, like twice, right? Yeah, go to Upwork and stuff. I think we do. Um, I've always had a V. I've had probably five VAs myself, Eric, that have helped me with uh, my just my business in general. Um, and the other thing too, I know this is going to sound really simple and stupid, but everybody in recruiting, I don't care whatever it is, it ha you have to have a Calendly or HubSpot calendar to choose from. I'm dealing with some l lending right now, SBA lending, and the SBA mm -hmm. lender is, they don't have a calendar. I'm like, I don't have time to set up this stuff. So wait a minute. So wait a minute. So to get in touch with you or, or like... What do you mean? Yeah. I understand so, the, the, cal the, the Calendly link, but is it to your calendar or is it to your setter's calendar? Every single person in your company. Anybody, that, anybody that's going to be Everyone. It is, it drives me nuts when people, oh, like, can you do this time at this time and that time? I'm like, here's my calendar. And that's another thing too. So if I type in on my phone, my, I, I, you can do uh, text shortcuts. I don't know if you know about that, but you can do text shortcuts on your phones and you can say, um, if I type in M, if I type in my C A L one word, it, my whole calendar will pop up the link uh, and it will say what's, like, what's the, here's, what, what's the, how do you do that on the short? Just, like, uh, the, just go, just go to settings. And then I believe it's keyboard. Okay. And then the keyboard under the keyboard, there's like shortcut or text something shortcut. Um, I don't know about Android, but I just taught Chris. And Nobody should be partners. using Android anyway. Like if you're listening to this podcast and you're on an Android, um, <laughs> we, got, we, we have other, other things. I got a Mac. I got everything Apple. So just for yeah, the it, Well, it's in the, re you know, I'm, I'm on an iMac right now. I have an iPad in front of me. I've got an iPhone. And the reason why I'm not, it's not hoity toity, but I literally have had this um, iMac for what, four and a half years now. You know, my wife has to change her IBM computer almost every year. It drives me crazy because she always had problems with it. I'm like, I, 
she goes, I need you to fix it. I'm like, it's not, it's, it's, it's a Microsoft computer. I stopped using these almost 20 years ago. And it's because of that. I spent $1,800 three times in a year and a half for a new computer. And I just got sick of it. My buddy was like, try a Mac. And I'm like, all right. So I tried it and I never went back. I said, I tried to, I tried, I remember the first time I'm like, wait, this is hard. And then I'm like, that's, I, it was hard for like a day. And now I'm like, this is the, I, it's all I have is Apple stuff. Yeah. All right. What other little, little, um, we're about done here, but like, what are the little hacks or little, little things that you, uh, find helpful, whether it's recruiting or just in your day to life, day to day life and productivity or getting things done. I mean, we're on t a technology, you know, uh, uh, rant right now with Apple. Is there some AI stuff? Is like, what do, what are you doing these days? Yeah, are you if you guys you guys probably talk about ChatGPT. Um, yeah, you know I found that to be very helpful in my business and everything I do. I even checked it and said, what are some cool franchise facts that people don't know? And it gave me like thirty five franchise facts, and probably about ten of them were really good. Like I was really surprised. Right. Um, I think one of the biggest things to do as far as like I showed this last time, um, we didn't really go through it today, but if you use a system, I have, I have a link to an Apollo uh, link that helps you with when you're going on LinkedIn and you, you can't, you can't. Yeah, so what we're going to talk about right now, just so the listeners know, um, we went through this in detail in the mastermind. Like you pulled up your screen. We like, we, we, we looked at different people's LinkedIn and we helped them with some of this stuff. So we went through what you're going to hear in the next two minutes in detail in the mastermind. So if you're interested in the mastermind, go to scalablefranchise.com. It's only $200 a month for franchisees. It's more for franchisors for that, that part of it. But this is, these are some of the things that we talk about in the mastermind. So kind of at a yep. high level, hit, hit that to give the listeners some value. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, when you're on uh, when you're on LinkedIn and you're trying to find the people uh, for the position, let's say for recruiting or for whatever, for uh, candidates and franchising, there are systems out there. Apollo is one of them um, that will actually put, you can have a Chrome extension. And when you pull up everybody on your LinkedIn, uh, you can actually see that you can find those people and it'll find their emails so you can contact them and then put them through a sequence. So whether you have HubSpot or whatever. Um, so or you can follow. pull them off. So you go on, you pull them off their contact information off of LinkedIn, and then you're able to email them mm -hmm. through a different platform. So you're not going through LinkedIn directly. And some of us get those annoying emails. Some of them I hate and some of them I'm like, yeah. oh, that's interesting. Right. Well, and you got to be interesting. You got to set yourself apart. You got to stop selling everything and just, you know, There's a lot that goes into it. You need to check out like the rules and everything to make sure you're, you're doing thing on the up and up, especially with email and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But you know, there's so many different ways to use technology and there's ways to do it the wrong way. There's ways to, to do it the right way. But part of it is knowing your candidate, knowing yeah. who you're looking for, whether it's French, a candidate for a franchisee recruiting, district operational managers for your, you know, three locations or five locations of whatever it is, wherever it is, like yeah. you just need to know who that candidate is. And then if you give them the right candidate, the right offer at the right time, that's when they're like, I'm so glad I heard from Eric. I heard from David. I heard from whoever it is. And that's, and that's when it works. If you're doing it to the wrong person at the wrong time uh, with the wrong offer, that's when it falls flat and you get people mad at you. And, you know, um, it's really important to, to, uh, um, uh, you were talking about pricing too, and I didn't tell you about it, but you know, like if you go to like, um, hierarch, uh, uh, dot com, which is my company. H I R E A R K. K. Yeah. Dot com. And then if you want to do something, I think that Laurie at, at, and Pam at, uh, Zen recruiter have a really cool program for companies to help their franchisees, Eric. And I actually, I would recommend talking with them because it's actually a pretty affordable way of doing it. They're what not even paying... master, um, to talk yeah. to master. Yeah. I think Pam and Laurie should do that because there's some very interesting stuff they're doing where it's, it's the franchisors in charge of it. But what ends up happening is the franchisor ends up paying, for, it pays for itself. And because the franchisees are bringing it in, but everyone's saving money. It's like a, it's a very low fee for what you're getting. I would recommend talking with, uh, I, th I believe it's zenrecruiter.net, Z-E-N, recruiter.net. 
and I would talk, I would, you know, have a conversation with them as well and just go directly to the source. Just talk to the people, you know, go, if you're, if you're a franchisee and you have a store, then go to other stores like yours and talk to the GMs and talk to the people and tell them you'll give them a sign on bonus or something. And they'll leave in a second. You give them a thing. You give people at the hourly rate, a thousand dollar sign on bonus. You just saved yourself $5,000 of recruiting fees for that position. <laughs> Well, this is good. Um, I just sent uh, her a message um, and uh, I was going to see if she's going to be at the F IFA. Are you going to be at the IFA? I'm going to be, I'm, I'm going to be there for like a day and a half because my dog yeah. Let's connect yeah, for I'll sure when you're there. And, um, but man, this has been fun. This is fun. I like this. I think hopefully Riverside works out for people, you know, for the, for both of us on, this new podcasting. Yeah, I, I love it. Just podcasting. Yeah, I love it. You know, I'm happy to, uh, I'm going to be doing some podcasts with, uh, um, it's called Goliath. And we're going to be talking to, um, you know, CEOs of franchising and other industries and stuff. But what it is, is it's basically, um, it's talking about the Goliath that they've had to overcome in their lives. Because everyone has a story. For and sure. I want to, I want to kind of share that with people. And then of course, we're going to be talking about like what they'd had to go through, what they worked through, what the best practices, all that kind of stuff, raising capital, everything. And I'd be happy to kind of help you out with your uh, podcast as well, because the, the, these are going to be, I have some big names. We have like billion dollar uh, CEOs and stuff that are going to be on this over the next uh, month. I'll be launching it. I'll probably have five to 10 episodes uh, before I launch it. So that way, when I'm marketing, it's going to be like, oh, watch this billionaire talk about his story of how he did it. And I have, and this is the thing is these guys that are coming on board to, on my podcast is because I've gotten to know them over the last 30 years. Right. And I, and I've seen what they've done and some of them I know really well and some of them I don't, but everyone is so, as you know, people are so open to talking oh, yeah. on a podcast. They're so open to just chatting and stuff. And, you know, I want to give back to them to the people too, so that, cause there's a, I mean, I'm glad we are doing what you're doing, Eric, uh, because I think it's really important to help these franchisees and franchisors. Chris has gotten a lot from you. Um, I met Chris because of this. And so, <laughs> is that, is that yeah. how you guys met? That's yeah. Awesome. We, I met on the French, on the franchise or thing. I literally rarely, uh, chat on there, but when I did, I saw Chris's, uh, th info and he's like, yeah, we, let's talk sometime. I said, sure. And it took about four or five months for us to get together, but we are working together and helping one Dude, another. That's awesome. Yeah. Like, yeah I so. love seeing, like, I never did anything with Chris. I had a good conversation with him, really liked him. And then, and so to kind of hear this full circle, like it's a small community and you just give value. That's what you do. You're always giving value. And, um, and that's how deals get done. That's how that's partnerships. Right. And form. that's cool. anything I can help you in your business and your podcasts and stuff. I'm always I'm here to help. And, you know, I did, I spent 15 years doing private equity and growing companies and starting franchisors. And I mean, that's, there's so much going on, but really, Eric, there's, it's not, a, it's not like some secret sauce. There are some sauces, but it's the whole recipe. <laughs> we gotta, you gotta break down the recipe a little bit and talk about those individual things. But I think there's a lot to, uh, just talking with Chris today for two hours, we, we, we came up with awesome solutions and we're pushing forward with everything and we're, we're getting lead generation going. We've got leads coming in now and there were no leads two weeks ago. And now all of a sudden yeah. everything's starting to roll and go. And once that engine starts going, that momentum, that's where you start to see the success, right? Dude, so, I love it, man. Yeah. I love it. Cool. All right, brother. I'll let you go. Thanks for doing right, buddy. this. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Franchise Secrets Podcast. Whether you're watching or listening, please make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel and to whatever channel you're listening on. If you want my help with anything from buying a franchise to franchising your business, please visit FranchiseSecrets.com.